You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California, here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go. Welcome to Win the Day with James Whitaker. If this is your first time here, I interview the world's top performers to give you everything you need to take ownership of your financial, physical, and mental health. The quote for this episode comes from Kerry Snow and says, no day is so bad it can't be fixed with a nap. That's a bit of a change of pace from the more inspirational quotes we usually include on this show, but I think it's an important one given how much stress we're feeling at the moment due to the pandemic and all its effects. Sometimes when we're exhausted or life gets us down, all we want to do is sleep. But how much do we really know about how to get a good night's rest? If we're spending about 30% of our time asleep, that adds up to almost 3,000 hours each year on a single activity. Yet when we think about peak performance, we rarely think about sleep as an important area to fix. On the show today, we've got the world's foremost authority on sleep. Now the title of this episode, Sleep Your Way to the Top, isn't what you think. Well, I guess we'll have to find out soon, but what it speaks to is how you can incorporate the latest biohacks to improve your sleep, relationships, energy levels, longevity, vitality, productivity, and pretty much every aspect of your life right now. Our guest is Dr. Michael Bruce, who is a three-time best-selling author, clinical psychologist, and sleep educator. He has appeared all over television, including Oprah, The Today Show, and on The Dr. Oz Show more than 40 times. Dr. Bruce is also a regular contributor to major publications such as the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. When he's not doing media appearances, Dr. Bruce works with some of the most successful individuals on the planet who want to perform at their peak with as little sleep as possible. In this interview, we'll go through the exact moment Dr. Bruce realized he was going to change the world, a five-point plan to improve your sleep right now, the latest hacks in sleep science to help you perform at your best, and a whole lot more. As we get started, remember the right bit of inspiration can completely transform someone's life. So if there's someone you know who needs to hear this episode, and I'm sure there is, lack of quality sleep is a dangerous side effect of the stressful world we're all living in today, share it with them right now. All right, let's win the day with Dr. Michael Bruce. Well, Dr. Bruce, great to see you, my friend. Thanks so much for being on the Win the Day show. I am excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, to kick things off, is there a story from your childhood that encapsulates what life was like for you growing up? (laughs) Is there a story from my childhood that encapsulates? That's a good question. I wasn't ready for this. I'm going to have to think for a second. Story from my childhood that encapsulates how I was brought up. Well, I can tell you about how I was brought up a little bit. Um, so I had a very interesting upbringing, which I think now that you're making me think about it has a lot to do with sort of how I became the guy that I am uh, in that uh, my parents were separated when I was nine and um, I'm 53 years old. And so back in those days, very few kids ended up with their fathers and I, my father ended up having full time custody of me. And it was just kind of he and I against the world for a very long period of time. And, um, you know, I've I've played that role um, as the sleep doctor. You know, I was one of the first people. I was the very first sleep blogger on the Huffington Post. You know, I was one of the first clinical psychologists to take and pass the sleep medicine boards, you know, things of that nature. I'm I'm very comfortable um, being the lone wolf, as it were, not to mention that I am a wolf chronotype, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, But, you know, that's a lot of who I am. I'm I'm pretty confident. Um, and um, I, I feel comfortable in my own skin for sure. Yeah, I love it. Well, you've been able to effortlessly uh, do so much to help so many people. You've got so many amazing media appearances and, and things that you've done. Okay, for the world. there's a lot of effort there. Let's not say <laughs> effortlessly. <laughs> That's there's true. A lot there. But I'm um, sure. no, thank you for saying so. I appreciate it. I meant to say more that you, you make it look very, very easy from the outside looking uh, well, in for all the you. amazing things that you've, you've done to make the world a better place and, of course, help people with their sleep, which has so many other ramifications for them. Can you take us into the moment that you realized that you weren't just going to be a regular health professional, that you were going to actually drive the industry forward and change the lives of millions of people in the process? You know, it was interesting. Um, the very first time I was on television, um, I walked off and it was like electric. It was like, I I didn't, it was so funny because people always say to me, it was one of the first um, appearances that I made and um, I didn't even see the audience. 
You know, I was so in the zone and I was so focused and I delivered this great information and I just became so comfortable out there. And it was just like, this is exactly where I need to be. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe I'm a ham. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, I've got enough ego to pull it off type of thing. But I, I like getting in front of people. Um, I like talking about sleep. I like mixing it up. Um, I like controversial ideas surrounding sleep and sleep science. Um, and um, here's the thing that's cool for me um, as a topic. You know, my wife says it all the time. She's like, honey, you wouldn't be nearly as interesting, you know, if you were a cardiologist, you know, because <laughs> there's lots of those floating around out there. No, no disrespect to the cardio guys. I have one myself. Um, but you know what I'm saying? Like sleep is such an interesting topic um, and, and it draws people in. Uh, James, because, you know, one of the things we know is that, you know, when you change your sleep, you change your life, right? And so if you have bad sleep and, and somehow or another, I'm able to to give you some information or, or lead you on a path that can help you with your sleep, I, I feel confident that I've changed your life in a positive way. And honestly, dude, that feels good. Um, I just like doing that. Um, and um, and it, it, early in my career, I know I'm rambling a bit, but early in my career, you know, I, I people would come and they would they would be so excited to tell me how much I had changed their lives. Um, and um, and after a while, it was every single day there would be five people, ten people, fifteen people, and I kind of said, you know. I want to get the message out bigger because at the time I was practicing um, and you can only see about 30 patients in a day. Right. And I mean, let's be fair. I was seeing 30 patients a day, you know, five days a week and I was crushing through 150 people. Um, good care of medicine, making sure that everybody's well treated. But it wasn't kind of where I wanted to be or where I thought the world kind of needed to hear. Um, so oddly enough, uh, one of my best friends got a vice president job at a company that was called Medscape at the time and then turned into this big old company called WebMD. Um, and he was like, Hey, Michael, have you checked out WebMD? So I went on it and they didn't have anything about sleep on there. So I, being my lone wolf self, decided to create a document that had all the places on the website where they needed to have more sleep information. And I sent it to my buddy who apparently sent it to his boss and his boss then said, go hire that guy. And that was how I became the WebMD um, sleep specialist. And I was the WebMD sleep specialist from the time they launched for 15 years. Um, and, you know, that's a big audience. Um, uh, it was so much fun, um, getting, you know, being able to, like, I did a chat. You remember back in the day when they had chat boards, mm -hmm. like I would answer questions live on chat boards for in WebMD about sleep. And I mean, we, th I think we counted, I answered over 5,000 questions in there at one time, you know, it's like, I just feel the need to educate and people are so receptive because it's just not an area where people get a chance to meet folks like me. So, you know, again, not breaking my arm, patting myself on the back, but I will say that I feel like I have a purpose um, and I feel like I have a passion. And so I feel like this is the point where purpose and passion hit for me was sleep. And that's what kind of drives me in that direction. Absolutely. It sounds like having these transformations for other people actually gives you a lot of energy along the process. And now that you've now that you've worked with regular folks right through to celebrities at the highest level, is there a particular transformation that you're most proud of? Oh, wow. You know, I'll, there's a there's a few, actually. Um, so uh, there's quite a few cases that were really there's some sad cases, um, for sure. Um, but there are quite a few cases that were were pretty amazing um, of the of the more famous cases that I've worked on uh, Carson Daly uh, from the Today Show. Um, you know, he it was real. I'll tell you the story. It was really interesting. I was on the Today Show talking about, you know, this time change or sleep or something like that. And he pulled me over to the side. We weren't on camera. And he was like, dude, I'm exhausted. And I was like, okay, hold, let's hold tight. So we did the segment and I came back afterwards and we, we went over to his dressing room and I'm like, tell me what's going on. And, you know, he, he had gained a little bit of weight over the years and, you know, he, and he, he said, so he was like, I, cause he's also, people don't know this, but he's on the today show and he's the executive producer of the voice at the same time. He flies every single week back and forth across the country. So not only does did, did, was he exhausted, but we could potentially have jet lag issues going on. There's all kinds of stuff that could be going on. So I dug in and turned out he had sleep apnea. Um, and so we worked with his doctor, got him sleep testing, the whole thing. And now we've got him on a solution that helps him, you know, sleep. And he's losing weight. He has more energy. Like he was really concerned about what he called his shelf life. Right. He was like, look, I'm on TV. How long can I be on TV, Michael? And uh, I think now he can be on for quite a bit longer. 
You know, yeah, it's it's amazing when you when you ch- I'm telling you something, dude, when you change somebody's sleep, you literally change their life. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. We often hear about people in terms of peak performance. They want to focus on things like nutrition uh, and mm-hmm. fitness. Yet there yeah. is so much. Yeah, there is so much misinformation out there on things like nutrition and fitness. Is it exactly right. the same with sleep? Considering we spend so much more time during the day sleeping than we do eating for for the most part, or on yeah. our fitness. Are there so many misconceptions out there? And what are the biggest myths that need to be busted with sleep? Yeah. So the answer is yes. Uh, there are a ton of misconceptions about sleep. You know, um, and, and it's really unfortunate. Um, some of them, because some of them drive some of these myths, right? And so, you know, some of the bigger myths, for, and, and we can even include nutrition in this, is things like, oh, turkey makes me feel sleepy because there's tryptophan in it, or warm milk makes me feel sleepy because. It, so, just to be clear, you'd have to eat about a 40-pound turkey, four zero. Okay, to get enough tryptophan to actually make it worth your while. And it doesn't work well in the presence of protein anyway. So I really wouldn't go for that one. And (laughs) I I think it's about a gallon and a half of milk has got (laughs) enough tryptophan. So that's just disgusting. So we're not even going to go there. Right. So like those are some of the things that are interesting. You know, when you think through that as an idea, but then then there's another kind of myth that I would argue that, you know, those are ones that we can, you know, laugh about. But like, let's look at, for example, melatonin. Right. So lots and lots and lots of people are taking melatonin. But what most people don't understand is melatonin is not a sleeping pill. Melatonin is a sleep regulator, not a sleep initiator. Right. Melatonin doesn't make you sleepy. What melatonin does is it helps your brain think that it's bedtime from a circadian rhythm perspective, right? So I'll give you a great example. Uh, we, you know, we were talking about Carson Daly. I have another patient. Um, if you're familiar with um, uh, electronic dance music, his name is Steve Aoki. He's a DJ. He does almost 200 shows a year in different countries every single time. And his jet lag is un paralleled, right? But when we're talking about something like this, what we're looking at is scheduling, trying to understand how to schedule flights, working through some of those different issues with them, and then trying to understand what to do. Well, melatonin is very, very helpful in that process of getting people adjusted to a new time zone because it tells your brain it's bedtime when your brain didn't think that it was bedtime before, right? That's great when you're Steve Aoki and you're jet lagging all over the place or Carson Daly flying back and cross. But when you're not crossing time zones and you're lying in bed, not sleeping, you really probably shouldn't be taking melatonin, right? Because that's really not what it's there for. So, you know, that's a myth or misunderstanding that we see that, that can be, you know, very harmful to folks. And then what happens is if one doesn't work, they take two. And if two don't work, they take four, you know, I mean, when I, you know, we were talking about WebMD, when I was on WebMD answering those questions, um, once a month, literally once a month, I got the question, is it okay to take a box of Benadryl a night? 20 10 milligram tabs. The answer is no, it's not okay. But that's, people are desperate, man. Like when you don't sleep, it hits you to your core. Mm-hmm. You turn into somebody that you don't like. Um, nobody around you is particularly thrilled um, with you either when you're not sleeping. It's, it's hard. To, to not have sleep. And many people who don't suffer from sleep problems, they really don't understand it. They're like, what are you talking about? Close your eyes, just go to bed. Come on, it's easy. Um, and you know, honestly, dude, people are tortured um, with some of their sleep related issues. And you know, right now, when we're talking about the pandemic and kind of what's going on in the universe, um, this is arguably the most stressful time any of us have ever had. And it's not, it's not the kind of stress that we're used to, to be fair. Right. Like, you know, I, I, we were talking before we started, you know, I live here in Los Angeles, you know, a a big stress here in Los Angeles is traffic, right? You know, (laughs) traffic doesn't mean crap compared to a pandemic. You know what I mean? Like I'm worried about things like my entire family's health, Mm. right? Like my grandparents, my parents, my kids, my wife, my extended family. I've never had to worry about everybody all at the same time. I've had to worry about certain people here and there, of course, as anyone would. Um, this is a different kind of worry, financial stress worry, right? Many people are suffering incredibly financially right now, right? What, what kind of weight does that put on your brain before you're getting in bed at night, right? Does, does that cause an insomnia? You bet it causes an insomnia, right? And so I would say that right now, it, if people 
turn to me and say, hey, Michael, I'm sleeping great. I'd be like, what's your trick, dude? Because nobody's sleeping great right now. Um, we all have got issues. I mean, I'm the sleep doctor. And let me tell you something. If something's going on with one of my kids, you know, it, it, when the pandemic first hit, yeah, I didn't sleep so great. OK, that's OK. The message here is, is that we're all humans. OK, and sleep is a reaction for us. So think about it like this. If you notice that your sleep is not so great, it could be a window into your health. Right. It could be giving you some clues about something that's going on for your mental health or it could be giving you clues about something that's going on for your physical health. But to be clear, if you're healthy, both mentally and physically, you should sleep pretty well, um, generally speaking. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? On that balance side, the times when I've had trouble sleeping is when I'm super excited about my work and the things that I've got yep. going on, or the complete opposite when I'm super stressed right. and, and on the brink of uh, on, on the brink of burnout. What are right. some sim what are some simple things that anyone watching this on YouTube or listening to the podcast mm -hmm. can do right now to improve the quality of their sleep? Oh, this is an easy one, and it's not going to cost you anything. Okay, I got a five step program. It's super simple. People are going to love it. So step number one is to wake up at the same time every single day, including the weekends. OK, so I know that sucks for most people because they're like, oh, I want to catch up on my sleep on the weekends, Michael. Come on. So here's the deal is if you if you wake up at the exact same time every single day, what will happen is, is that the quality of your sleep will improve because your circadian rhythm is consistent. OK, when, because remember, when you wake up, that's kind of like the reopening of the package. Right. And so the new day comes, sunlight comes in and then all of your hormones kick off and go into gear. So if you do that at the same time, every single day, your brain knows what's coming. It can prepare for it and it's much more efficient. Also, by the way, if you wake up at the exact same time every single day, what you will find is that the amount of sleep that you require begins to shrink. So I did this experiment on myself. And so I'm a night owl, what I call a wolf. And I go to bed around midnight every single night. That's just what I do. I really can't get in bed before midnight. That's just me. Um, and so I got in bed at midnight and I woke up around 740. After about a month of it, I was waking up at 720. After another month of it, it was seven o'clock. I wake up now at 613 almost every single day. I'm not sure why it's 613. People always ask. I always look at the clock and I say, oh my God, it's 613. But it really is. Um, but my entire sleep cycle shrank by almost a full cycle, like almost a full 90 minute cycle. I pushed in, I get six hours and 13 minutes of sleep and I've looked at it on trackers and my sleep is fantastic. What's happened is the consolidation has occurred because of the consistency. Step number one, wake up at the same time every single day. You will get higher quality sleep and you will probably need less unless you have an underlying sleep disorder or something like that. Step number two has to do with caffeine. So, okay, we get it. Caffeine is a problem. It's a stimulant. I understand. Um, but what we know is it's got a half-life of about six to eight hours. And so with a half-life like that, what we do is we say stop caffeine by 2 p.m. Eight hours later is 10 o'clock. That's kind of where most people in North America start to tend to turn in. So that's the, the reasoning behind the recommendation. Okay. Now, I guarantee you there's a listener or a watcher out there who's going to be like, ha. Huh, sleep doctor. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I can have a cup of coffee, espresso, cappuccino minutes before going to sleep and I can fall asleep. No problem. I think so, I've said that before as well. <laughs> well, see, there you go. So let's, let's bust that myth. And so here's what's interesting is it turns out that people have different caffeine sensitivities. So um, different people, I, I had one patient who um, honestly could drink a pot of coffee and go to sleep. And I had another one who could eat a, a chocolate bar, a, a square of chocolate and be up for days. So that's number one. But here's the other thing is for my patient who could drink a pot of coffee and go to sleep. If you stick electrodes on somebody's head, Caffeine's a stimulant. You, you can't stop the fact that it is stimulating. And what it does is it almost completely obliterates stage three, four sleep. For folks out there who don't know, stage three, four sleep is your physical restoration. That is your wake up and feel great sleep. You do not want anything messing with that. And right now during COVID, I'll tell you why even more importantly, during stages three, four sleep is where growth hormone is emitted. And this is where your killer T cells are produced. Killer T cells are what fight viral infection. Hello, we want as much stage three, four sleep as we can possibly get right now. So please, please, please slow down your caffeine. And if you could eliminate it altogether, that would be great. Don't do it cold turkey. I had two patients end up in the ER 
believe it or not, going cold turkey off of caffeine. One of them had a seizure and one of them just couldn't stop puking. It was a mess. So slow, if you're a, if you're a heavy, heavy drinker, slow it down over the course of time. But if you can, stop caffeine by 2 p.m. Step number three has to do with alcohol. There's a really big difference, dude, between going to sleep and passing out, okay? People don't seem to understand that sometimes, and so that's why we have to kind of get in there. It takes the average human approximately one hour to digest one alcoholic beverage. The data would suggest that the time between the last sip and when you close your eyes, that gap is the most important amount of time when looking at alcohol's effects on your sleep. Um, remember, alcohol is a depressant, so it will make you feel sleepy up until about two to three drinks. Once you get past the three drink, unfortunately, it has a tendency to energize people or make them aggressive. So you really don't wanna go over two drinks if you possibly can. That's number one. That time period though is very important. If it takes the average human one hour to digest one alcoholic beverage, here's how I kind of run it. Is if you're gonna have a glass of wine with dinner or two, let's say it's six o'clock, and you finish then, or let's say you finish by seven and you had two glasses of wine, then you would be able to go to sleep by nine o'clock, right? Do me a favor for every glass of wine, drink one glass of water. So if you had two glasses of wine, drink two glasses of water, wait two hours. It's really very simple. It's the one to one to one rule. Um, I found this to be very, very effective for people. Also, let's be honest, if you're using alcohol as a sedative, you have a problem, okay? Talk to your doctor. There are much better ways of helping you get a good night's sleep than drinking yourself there. Also, you're not alone. Alcohol is the number one sleep aid in the world. More people use alcohol to make themselves fall asleep. And once again, you don't get that deep sleep. Just like with what caffeine does to stage three, four sleep, alcohol does the same thing. But it also screws up your REM sleep as well, which is why your memory is all kind of messed up after a heavy night of drinking. So if you can, stop alcohol three hours before bed. On to the more positive side of things is exercise. So I'm a huge fan of exercise, um, and but the good news is you don't have to run a marathon, okay? Exercising daily is incredibly important. And I would argue, especially during the pandemic, this is one of our biggest issues. Remember guys, sleep is recovery. If you do not do anything to recover from, your body is not going to sleep as deeply. It just doesn't work that way, right? So get your butt outside. Um, sunlight is an important and good thing. So is fresh air and so is exercise. But if you're going to do your workouts, which I want you to do, you need to be careful because remember, sleep follows the core body temperature cycle. And so as you fall asleep, your core body temperature begins to drop. Unfortunately, exercise raises our core body temperature, which is why we sweat. So step number four is to exercise daily, but stop exercise four hours before bed. Last step, step number five, I know I'm a little long-winded on this one, but I promise it I'll get there, is for waking up. So when we wake up in the mornings, what we really want to make sure of is that we can kind of clear the brain fog and get ourselves moving. Do not drink coffee as the first thing that you drink. Um, most people don't realize it, but sleep in and of itself is a dehydrative event. Um, from the humidity in our breath, we lose almost a full liter of water every night. Um, so you should, sitting by your bedside, you should have about 20 to 30 ounces of room temperature water in a refillable glass, jug, mug, whatever, okay? Um, every single night, you should put one of those there. When you wake up in the morning, take five to 10 deep breaths just to activate your respiratory system and orient yourself to space. Sit around on the side of your bed, grab your water, walk to the window, and get 15 minutes of sunlight. Michael, why sunlight? So the data would suggest that blue light in particular hits a particular cell in your eye called a melanopsin cell, which sends a signal to your brain to turn off the melatonin faucet in your head. We want the melatonin off when we wake up. This is why we like blue light in the morning, but why we don't really like blue light at night because it suppresses melatonin as well. Do me a favor. If you've gotten out of the bed, grabbed your water and walked over to the window to get your sunlight, put on a robe. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying, put on a robe. So in summary, step number one, wake up one time. Step number two, stop caffeine by 2 p.m. Step number three, stop alcohol three hours before bed. Step number four, exercise daily, stop exercise four hours before bed. And step number five is drink 30 ounces of water and give the sun a high five for 15 minutes every day.
so many amazing things to unpack there. <laughs> first, first of all, if, if you mentioned marathons, if someone say if I do a marathon today and my body is mm-hmm. absolutely exhausted, yet I'm usually mm-hmm. waking up at five o'clock in the morning, do I set an alarm to wake up at five o'clock tomorrow, even though I am physically really, really exhausted? Or do I give my body just one day off to sleep as long as it wants? I would give your body one day off to sleep from a marathon because it's such an extended type mm-hmm. of thing. Um, when I work with professional athletes, usually the day after the game contest or race, um, we kind of let them sleep in. Also, depending upon the competitive nature of it, you, they end up doing a lot of damage to their bodies. And, you know, in marathon work, everybody gets hurt by the end of the marathon. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You, you hear a lot of people talk about waking up and having like lemon juice first thing in the morning. I mean, how much, first of all, can like a teaspoon or two of lemon juice do anything? Is, is that a myth that needs to be busted right here, right I, now? I have to tell you, I've never heard of lemon juice being particularly effective in the morning. I will tell you, though, that the vitamin C from lemons in the citrus actually has been shown to be helpful for keeping circadian rhythms in line. Um, And so, you know, people ask me all the time about supplementation and vitamins, minerals, things like that. That's the only thing I could think of from a lemon juice perspective. Um, I tried doing that apple cider vinegar in the mornings and I almost puked. (laughs) <laughs> you mentioned sunlight as well, waking up and getting sun, uh, sunlight as soon as you can. If it's 5am, yes. the middle of winter, and there is no sun mm-hmm. to be found, is turning on a light a good idea? I've, I've actually found even having something like a cold shower, which I do every single morning. That's a good um, jolt because I am. I wake up and I feel I have no energy. I'm exhausted. Every, I'm a bear chronotype on your okay. on your online assessment. And I wake mm-hmm. up every day for my entire life and I have, I'm have. i always exhausted every single morning, 100% of the time. But the moment I have a cold shower and then I've been right. trying to do what you suggest like 90 minutes or longer later to have my have a coffee. Uh, right. But that, that cold shower seems to be a massive energy boost for the, for the rest of the day. In the absence of sunlight, is there something else that can fill in? Well, so there are actually commercially available light boxes, believe it or not. So you could go on to Amazon um, and Philips makes one called the uh, Go Light, G-O-L-I-T-E. Um, it's, I think it's 90 bucks. I have one in my suitcase because I use it for jet lag when I travel, right? Because you can forward your circadian rhythm using light, caffeine, and melatonin and sleep in particular patterns. Um, to, that's how we work with people like Steve Aoki and Carson Daly is we, we mess with all of those things. We have an algorithm. It's actually pretty cool. Um, but you know, when you kind of look at those things, I would say light is certainly one thing that would be helpful in the morning. Um, the, the temperature challenge is definitely helpful in the morning. I do a temperature challenge most mornings. I don't do it for my entire shower. I do it for like the last 30 seconds type of thing. I don't have a cold plunge at my house, although I'd kind of like one. It's kind of a cool idea. Um, it's definitely alerting. I can assure you of that. Um, it, for healthy ways to wake up in the morning, um, I also think that breath work is something that I've personally found to be very helpful. I have a men's group that I meet with every morning on Zoom and um, we do Wim Hof breathing together. I don't know if you're familiar with Wim Hof. Absolutely. Yep, so um, we have a whole group together and we do Wim Hof breathing in the mornings and then we have a, a small meditation of great gratitude. Um, and that's how I start my day. And honestly, I'm awake and alert and present. It's awesome. Are there, are there people, lines you describe them in your book, are there people who wake up and they actually say, wow, I'm full of energy while they're in bed and oh, just can't dude, wait the to Oh, dude, the lines do. Oh, yeah. Based on the chronotype, yeah. So, I mean, we haven't really talked about chronotypes. So, I came up with this categorization of chronotypes. To be clear, there were chronotypes long before I came up with it. I ended up finding the fourth one. Um, so, we used the chronotypes of things like early bird, night owl, people in the middle. Um, and that's kind of what we've been kind of bantering back and forth about. You know, but you talk about chronotypes, it's, it's interesting. There are about 15% of the population and God love them. They like getting up in the morning. Like, honestly, dude, the only thing I hate more than mornings are morning people, right? <laughs> There's a damn chipper like, eh, it's so great to be up. I'm like, I hate being up. This, and I wake up naturally now at 615. So I'm like, even it's even worse. I'm like, I'm a wolf in the morning, right? So like my sleep is consolidated, but I don't want to talk to anybody. That's for sure. Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. Isn't it? we, we've we've heard a lot of stuff about like everyone needing eight hours of sleep a night. Total horseshit. Is right? it really? So, yeah. Well, so look, the math doesn't even work, right? And so, uh, average sleep cycle is ninety minutes long. Average human has five of them. So five times ninety is four hundred and fifty minutes, which is only seven and a half hours. So like the math doesn't even work on average to get you there. I think the original recommendation came from a study done at Stanford, like in the 50s 
um, where they put people in these like self-contained chambers and they left them there forever and ever and ever. Uh, I mean, they fed them and they had bathrooms and all that kind of stuff. Um, and what happened was, is their sleep uh, amount went up and then eventually came back down and their bodies would no longer allow them to sleep any longer than I think it was like eight hours and 13 minutes. And so I think that's where the recommendation of eight hours originally came from. Um, but to be fair, that's not a smart way of trying to figure that idea out. Number one, I think it was an all male study. And uh, by the way, sleep has changed a lot since the 50s, <laughs> right? You know, like, I mean, you know, even thinking about it, like philosophically as a concept, like, like, remember, like, uh, well, I mean, you're young, but like in the 50s, um, you know, people slept in separate beds. And like, it was a whole different universe for sleep back then. Whereas now, people have televisions in their bedrooms, they have video games, they have bed. I mean, there's a, it's a whole different universe. And so um, sleep evolves, right? And so as it continues to do so, and with these levels of stress that we're all experiencing, and, and uh, with some of the environmental um, insanity that's, you know, going light here and, you know, kids playing video games until four o'clock in the morning and all that kind of stuff, you, you know, you're going to see some sleep consequences for sure. For sure. You know, I'm, I'm someone who is constantly focused on peak performance. It's a big part of my work is trying to figure that out for myself and for other people. A couple of years ago, I tried, and I'm sure you would have heard this before, I've tried to download a sleep tracker app and I put it, I think it was on my iPhone. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. woke up the next day and I, I felt pretty good. And then I looked at my phone and it said that I had a shitty sleep. And I was like, oh, well, I must, I, I should feel like crap then. Right. So I did. Then okay, the next so day, yeah, then the next day I woke up and I felt miserable. And then I looked at the app, it said I had an amazing sleep. And I'm like, oh, that knows nothing. So I felt like crap anyway. So I was none from two and I haven't used a sleep tracker since. <laughs> so, so here's the thing about sleep trackers, right? Is so um, I, I, the best of the, the, it's like the best of the worst. Okay. So when you, when you look at the history of sleep tracking, here's what we've discovered is people were tracking activity before they were tracking sleep. So it's not too hard to measure steps, right? My daughter, she's 17 years old. She's pretty good at math. You know, if I, if I know the length of your leg and your gait, that's a calculus problem. Like I can figure out how to track your steps, but if I'm going to track your sleep, what do I measure? Is it how quickly you fell asleep? Is it how quickly you get to stage three, four? Is it how quickly you get to REM? Is it the number of REM periods? Is it your number of awakenings? Dude, I can go on for like 30 or 40 more variables if you want me to, right? It's a complicated process. So thinking that a, a wristband, a ring, a pad, a something is going to do a great job of truly measuring our sleep is probably a fallacy at this point in time. Um, Will we see it in the future where we will see a high level of accuracy? I think we will. Um, how far is that future? I think it's less than 18 months to two years away. Um, I think we will get much, much better at this much, much faster. Um, as machine learning and AI and algorithms start to get more involved in crunching some of those big data sets, I think we'll start to learn a whole lot more. Um, but here's what I tell people is if you've got a sleep tracker, it's still useful, all right? And I'll explain to you how is don't look at the absolute data, look at the relative data, right? So if my sleep tracker says that I have 13 minutes of stage three, four sleep every single night, I know that's not accurate, but it's consistently inaccurate. However, if I got 13 minutes one night and 407 the next and you know 612 the next, I want to know what's happening, relatively speaking. That's where I think people should, don't get caught up in the what should it be, compare it to yourself look at your own data, and then you're your best scientist, right? Mm -hmm. So when you wake up in the morning, however you perceive you slept, it's probably pretty accurate, mm -hmm. right? Sleep is a perception. There's a physical state of unconsciousness where lots of cool shit happens. But when you wake up in the morning, how you think you slept, I would argue, is probably the best marker of how you actually did sleep, right? And so Trackers or no trackers, there's lots of things that we can do to improve our sleep and our performance. I, I would argue that consistency is certainly the biggest one. Um, I have a high performance sleep coaching practice here in Los Angeles, um, a, as you know. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we do um, is we we evaluate people right when they walk through the door. And so a lot of people come to me, they're like, hey, Michael, I, I know I need eight and I can I only have six. What can you do? You know, and so believe it or not, I can actually fix that problem. Um, like I was telling you earlier, it's learning what their chronotype is, getting them more consistent. And then I actually run blood work on people. Um, so I look at things like iron, magnesium, vitamin D, melatonin, right? All of those are things that if you're deficient in them, gonna have a really big effect on your sleep. 
So, you know, we want to make sure that we're starting out at good levels. And then if everything looks good there, um, believe it or not, I do a full genetic screen. So I take their DNA from a 23andMe, Ancestry.com, something like that. And I can I run it through an algorithm with 74 different sleep markers. Uh, and I get a roadmap of what your sleep is going to look like now and what it's going to look like in the future. And then we um, we taper to the future. So as an example, I had one fella, um, prominent CEO here in town, and we discovered that he had a genetic propensity for sleep apnea. Um, he's a lean guy, not somebody who you would ever expect to have sleep apnea. And so what we do now is um, we contacted his physician and at, at all of his appointments, we measure his neck size because the, one of the big markers for sleep apnea is neck size. Anybody who has over a 17 and a half inch neck has something like an 80% chance of having sleep apnea. So if I, if I now monitor his neck, if, if he goes a bigger collar size, we get on it real quick. Right. And we make sure that things are copacetic because we don't want him to get that sleep apnea. Um, we had another one with somebody with restless legs. Same thing. Had the propensity, didn't have the symptomatology. Make sure that we avoid it in the future. That kind of stuff is pretty cool. If you get someone who comes in who's got PTSD or, or depression, mm -hmm. some type of severe condition like that, do you change your approach or is it pretty similar to what you just outlined? You know, I do change my approach, um, especially with people with PTSD. Um, so I did a lot of work with, with patients with PTSD during my residency at the University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I'm going to say something that's a little on the controversial side, um, so I hope that that's okay. But one of the only things I was able to find for my veterans to help them sleep after they had been in an active theater of war was cannabis. Um, you know, I, I mean, I understand, you know, we live in California, it's legal here, it's recreational here. Um, it's literally the only thing I've ever found that worked in, in my PTSD patients in particular. Um, there's this hypervigilant switch that pops in these folks. You know, if you've been in an active theater of war, um, you know, your head's on a swivel, you know, you're making sure that you're okay at all times. That just doesn't turn off when you come home. Um, and so, and, and I'm not suggesting everybody goes out and smokes weed to sleep, okay? But what I am saying is, is that there's a there's something there, right? There are lots of now um, sleep related products in the dispensaries. Um, most of them, to be fair, don't work particularly well. Um, I do believe that THC is an important component in reduction of anxiety. I believe that CBN, um, which is one of the cannabidiols, can be very important uh, in helping uh, with sleep. Uh, there's some interesting data to suggest that. CBD, unfortunately, you'd have to have a tremendous amount of it as far as the data is concerned to make it be really effective. So I don't think we're there yet, but for PTSD, I think we're close. Um, and I, I'm excited to see some of those cannabis studies kind of come out. Depression is a whole different ball game. So, you know, PTSD in my mind, I think of it more on the anxiety side of things. While there's a tremendous depressive component to this, and I understand that, um, depression in and of itself is a far, is very interesting um, when you look at it. But, you know, for people who have depression, they have very interesting sleep signs. So for example, most people, you don't see REM sleep approach until about 80 minutes into the, into the cycle. With people with depression, 30 minutes in, they're in REM sleep. Three zero minutes in, they're in REM sleep. So sometimes we're in the sleep lab, we can identify somebody with depression sometimes before they even know they have it, which is kind of an interesting, you know, concept, right? It's a biomarker, if you will, um, for depression, which I think is in and of itself quite interesting as well. So, I mean, again, there's lots of different ways to approach all of these different things. Uh, obviously, it's all about good medicine and good science. <laughs> Absolutely. Have you noticed anything about the delivery method of cannabis? Like, is it smoking versus edibles or anything uh, else? Yes. Great question. Great question. I would argue that the preferred um, uh, administration method um, would probably be a tincture, like a dropper, right, with a liquid that you could put underneath your tongue. Because for sleep, we have to get it up and in to your brain fairly quickly. And so if it's a gummy, you got to eat it. It's got to go down to your belly. It's got to mix around. It's got to get back up there. You're talking about, you know, 90 minutes um, or so. I'd love to see um, a tincture that would work a little bit faster. Um, things of that nature, I think, would make sense. For sure. I, I know you've got your sunglasses out now or your, your glasses yep. rather, the block light, which is amazing. People who work at nighttime, say if they if they do, if they Shift based work. on their chronotype, yeah, yeah, they should be working late at night. But if they do want to work in front of a computer, is it the mm -hmm. is it the light of the computer and the devices that they're on, or is it their brain being an absolute beehive of activity that keeps them awake at night? 
Dude, it's both, right? It's both, right? So we've got it. It's a two factor thing here. So, you know, I'm the only sleep doctor, I think, in the universe that says it's okay to fall asleep with the television on um, because it's passive content, right? You're lying back. Content is just kind of flowing over you. You're watching an old episode of Seinfeld. You close your eyes. You're barely listening and you fall asleep. Okay. That's very different than trying to get your high score on Candy Crush, you know, right? Or trying to knock it out on Facebook and get through as many things as you can. You know, like that's an active engagement that I think we want to say no thank you to. Um, but the, the blue light in and of itself and the active brain, like you identified, I would argue that it's both. Yeah, absolutely. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Well, do you mind if we move into the rocket round now? I'm just conscious of your time. Have you got about three or four minutes rocket left? Rocket it up, questions? brother. Let's do it. All right. This is uh, 10 questions for some fairly quick answers. Number one, what quote inspires you the most? Oh, my gosh. I'm not very rockety. What quote <laughs> inspires me the most? Oh, um, uh, I can't remember who said it, but um, it's every day is a good day. I either win or learn love it i know there's a few people who said that nelson mandela conor mcgregor a whole bunch of people thank win you or learn. thank yeah. you nelson mandela that's who i heard it yeah love it one of my favorite uh number two morning coffee or evening wine oh i don't do either because neither one's great for sleep um but what i'll tell you i do do in the morning is i um i am hydrating uh and then i'm taking my magnesium and all my supplements <laughs> <laughs> number three what's one bit of advice you would give your 18 year old self Oh, dude, my 18 year old self, buy Apple. <laughs> I think that's the best answer we've had for that question, actually. <laughs> Number four, what book do you gift the most? Oh, um, oh, I have it. Where is my, um, it's, uh, here it is. Yeah, it's called, um, I just started giving this to people. It's called The Daily Stoic. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's by Absolutely. Ryan Holiday. Ryan Holiday, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. It's just it's about the you know the great Greeks and and their philosophies and thinking about stoicism and just like you know how to be a, a good human. I like that one. Love it. Number oh, and the second one I just started reading, which I would recommend, I'm, and I'm probably going to give it away. It's called Green Lights. It's by Matthew McConaughey of all people. Oh yeah, it's, it's a brand book. new it's, one, isn't it? Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, I need to check it out. I haven't read that one yet. Number oh, five, really good. Was, was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower? Yeah, I used to not like to talk in front of people. Look at you now. <laughs> I know. I mean, I've been on Tony Robbins stage in front of 13,000 people. I've been on, you know, with Dr. Oz. It's crazy. But yeah, I was not, uh, I wasn't always like this. <laughs> <laughs> Number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? I need it. Um, failure is where I learn. Um, you know, every, every time I have a success and it's easy, gosh, I don't learn nearly as much as if I had a success that, you know, required a few failures beforehand. So failure is my learning tool. Mm, so true. Number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? Uh, oh, that's sad. Um, so the father of sleep medicine just passed away. His name's Bill Demet. I'd kind of like to say goodbye to him. Mm, mm, I love it. Number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or your business? What tool or resource best helps me run my life or my business? Um, you got a lot of products of your own here. This is a good chance for a, I know, for a plug. I here. know. I can hype it up, plug it up. Um, honestly, um, my adherence to my schedule um, and my just discipline in that has probably been the thing that's been the most influential. But if I had to pick something, I would say my breathwork group, my, my men's group. Um, sometimes it's good to just talk to guys. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Number nine, yeah, especially in this world of isolation and things that we're in at the moment, I think it's nice just to have any type of, of social contact, <laughs> whatever it yeah, might be. <laughs> absolutely. Number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. Oh, uh, well, one of my bucket things was um, speaking for Tony Robbins, um, which I got to do. Um, yep, yep, I got to do that. It was I was on the last live UPW. Um, so it was in Miami, 13,000 people in the audience. It was a rush. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And last question, what's one thing you do to win the day? Go up. Um, I show up positive. Uh, that's been a struggle for me for a long time. 
Um, and that's really what I do every single day. I wear a bracelet and it's got um, positivity and patience on it. And I think about those two things every day. If I can do those two things, I am good to go. Good stuff. Well, there are a bunch of ways to connect with Dr. Bruce and we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can follow him on Instagram at The Sleep Doctor. Grab a copy of his book, The Power of When on Amazon and find your chronotype, which is amazing. And I highly recommend that using his free online assessment at thepowerofwhenquiz.com. Thepowerofwhenquiz.com. Again, all of that and more will be linked in the show notes. Dr. Bruce, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, this was fun. This was a different one. Usually people just ask me boring questions. You had some good questions in there, man. I appreciate it. Love it. We'll see you down at Manhattan Beach sometime soon. Let's go surfing. You like El Porto, right? Love it. Yeah. We'll check it out. Let's go. Hey, everybody out there, sweet dreams. I hope you enjoyed all the tips Dr. Bruce revealed to help you with your performance, productivity, and presence each day. We want to know your favorite takeaway from this episode. To do that, just go to Apple Podcasts and mention it in the review section or on YouTube, just drop your favorite takeaway into the comments. I'll be picking three people to send a free copy of Michael's book, The Power of When, to wherever you are in the world. If you enjoyed this episode, hit that subscribe button and share it with a loved one. Win the Day with James Whitaker is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts. That's all from us. Remember to get out there and win the day. And I definitely think you'll win the night after this episode. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always.